computational geometry. So take it away, Yang. Okay, so welcome back. So hello everyone. Uh, this is Yang Zheng. I'm from China. Uh, I'm working in University of Science and Technology of China. I'm very glad uh, to give you the three lectures about the introduction to the computational algebra geometry. So first of all, I have to apologize a little bit on the change of the title, because if you read the schedule, it seems to something like introduction to algebra geometry. I think the whole algebra geometry is a very huge subject. I'm definitely not the person to introduce uh, such a huge subject just in three lectures. So I changed the title to the computational com uh, algebra geometry. That means I'm going to focus on the practical and the computational part of the algebra geometry. Okay, so let's start. So as a theoretical physicist, you get a lot of computations, okay, with uh, polynomials and rational functions and more complicated functions, transcendental functions, some matrices, all these kind of uh, objects. So the thing is uh, in uh, my lectures, I'm going to focus on the polynomial and the rational functions and sometimes the matrices. You can see this kind of objects, very difficult computations in many kinds of uh, scattering amplitudes computations like Feynman integral reduction, like the differential equation for Feynman integrals, but also in other subjects in theoretical physics, like uh, for integrability, if you try to solve the beta ansatz equation, it's also not an easy task. And also sometimes if you say, if you, you, you are working with some more formal aspects of theoretical physics like string theory, then possibly you have a very complicated super potential. Try to find the minimum of the potential. Although it could be just a polynomial question, but it's a difficult one. Okay. So it's not surprising that in many cases, the polynomial or rational function computation is the most time and uh, uh, the RAM consuming step. And in many cases, if you really do some kind of research projects, you get the identical results. Now it's not surprising that in many cases, you find that actually um, most part of the result, uh, they are just a very, very long polynomial, so very long rational functions, okay. And uh, you also get some kind of transcendental functions, but there are some very tiny piece of your identical results. So uh, it's my task to introduce uh, how to do this kind of polynomial or rational function or some matrix computations from a high level. I would claim the key to the uh, polynomial and the rational function problem is a computational algebra geometry. So here, um, this is the overall picture of my lectures. So uh, I have to say that I have to introduce some mathematical concepts very, very quickly because I only have three lectures. I will quickly go through what is the classical algebra geometry. And then I'm going to introduce some of the computer algorithms. When you combine these two things together, this mathematical algebra geometry and also the algorithms, you get a computational algebra geometry. So I apologize that um, due to the time, I have to skip most of the mathematical proof. And I will give you some reference and you can check. Okay, so computational algebra geometry could be a quite, quite a new subject, depends on your definition of this subject, okay. So roughly speaking, it started in the uh, 1970s and got very popular after uh, 2000s. And here I list uh, many famous mathematicians who contributed a lot to this subject. Okay, so here that's uh, the overview of my lecture. So I will first introduce you to some kind of a basic com this, uh, uh, commutative algebra and algebra geometry. And then I give you some kind of introduction to the algorithm, the book book algorithm and the Schreiber algorithm. And I also give you a lot of examples. So in most cases, I will try to do it with mathematics, but nowadays since computational algebra, algebra geometry is developing so fast, so for hard questions, maybe you have to use some other uh, software like Maple or Singular, Macaulay tool, or even sometimes Bertini. Okay, so here is my reference. So uh, if you really try to understand okay, all these kind of um, mathematical concepts, you have to spend 
at least maybe one semester on this. So here I listed some of the reference. So first there's uh, two books by uh, Cox, Osher and Little. So one is this undergraduate textbook about uh, computational algebra geometry and uh, uh, some algorithms. And uh, also there's a graduate level a textbook using algebra geometry. And also that's a very good book, okay, from the singular group because uh, this book is both conceptual and also a, a programming book because it's everything is associated with the program singular. And finally, okay, if you really to do this, want to do this subject seriously, you have to read this hard book. So I recommend this book to you. This algebra geometry by Ruben Hutshaw. So this one is a very difficult book, but uh, the good thing is you don't need to read the whole book. You just need to read the chapter one, but just to read the chapter one, maybe you need to spend maybe three months on this, okay. From chapter two, this book is as hard as a stone and uh, is uh, nice uh, related to physics yet. And uh, I just hope you to read the chapter one of this book. This is a Bible of algebra geometry. The this uh, Hutchins book, and also I put my lecture notes about uh, okay, several years ago. This lecture notes on the multi loop integral reduction and applied algebra geometry. So um, this this is also quite a long lecture notes about one hundred pages. But uh, um, the mathematical level, of course, is much much lower than this kind of a classical reference. So you can quickly go through. Uh, my paper and try to understand some applications of uh, computational algebra and geometry. But I have to say that uh, some things in this kind of lecture notes is a little bit uh, out of the date because nowadays the uh, techniques is developing very, very fast and a lot of things uh, somehow you get a better way to solve. But I would say the mathematical concepts in this book is still something useful. Okay. Okay. So that is my uh, schedule. So in the next one, I'm going to talk about the very basic thing, the very classical thing, this affine variety and the group of basis for algebra geometry. In the second lecture, I'm going to talk about the primary decomposition and the zero dimensional ideas. In the third one, I'm going to talk about the module and the CCG. So the third lecture is uh, more with matrices, but the first two, uh, lectures are more with polynomial and the rational functions. Uh, I would say that the first lecture is quite, quite dense. So maybe in the, today I'm not going to finish the lecture one, but uh, I will catch up in the uh, second and the third day of my lecture. Okay, so the first one, I find variety and the group of basis. So we have to very, very quickly go through some of this kind of mathematical concepts in algebra geometry. So uh, first, uh, thanks Ben. Uh, from the previous lecture, you already know what the field is. So uh, in this lecture, we are going to talk about polynomials. So we are going to talk about uh, the set of all polynomials in X1 to Xn. This field, that is the choice of the coefficients, this field could be complex number, could it be rational number, could it be finite field, okay? Actually the finite field is very, very useful, very, very convenient thing, okay? You will learn that uh, in the future from the other lecture. And uh, also uh, sometimes we use uh, uh, some of this kind of uh, uh, parameters, these parameters could be C1 to CM, this kind of things they are not variable, the parameters as our field. So basically we are talking about the polynomial ring, the set of all polynomials. And uh, in many cases, this thing is a very like linear algebra. I can think that it's a nonlinear version of a linear algebra. So in linear algebra, so first we define the whole linear space, but uh, usually we are not working with the whole uh, linear space. We are working with the subspace, okay? So here we are also working a subset of the polynomial rings. So we talk about the ideal. So the ideal I in the polynomial ring, of course, is uh, first it's a linear subset uh, of the ring such that, okay, if you pick up any kind of uh, polynomial in this ideal and uh, multiply by an uh, arbitrary polynomial in this ring, then the result of the multiplication is still in this ideal. So I will tell you why uh, we give this kind of definition. Okay, so this is the definition of the ideal. So right now it's just to remember it. It's a subset of the polynomial. 
So uh, the idea is the basic thing of uh, our study. So in most cases, we don't use this kind of abstract uh, definition of an idea or use this kind of thing. So in many kinds of mathematical questions, you have some of the polynomial, this polynomial given could be you are trying to solve some equations like the uh, scattering equation, CHY equation, or beta ansatz equation. They are equations, okay? And they are simple enough. All the equations uh, are algebraic and you can do some kind of math to convert all the kind of things to polynomials. So we have this kind of uh, F, they are already given. Then we try to say that given this F uh, with this uh, subscript uh, I, now we try to generate a subset of the uh, polynomial ring. So we try to generate an idea of it. This is the way to generate the idea from this F. It's very much like linear algebra. You multiply by arbitrary HI. So this I here is uh, also a polynomial. If you just multiply by some kind of coefficient in the field, okay, then it's trivial as a linear algebra. But here we have the freedom to multiply any kind of polynomial in this ring. So this one is algebra geometry, it's not a linear algebra. So if you have this kind of Fi, okay, in a subset S, then we use this kind of bracket notation, bracket S. So that is the ideal generated by S. So here is some definition. We have the whole set of the polynomial ring. We have this ideal which is subset. So the first theorem I'm not going to prove is any idea in a polynomial ring is finitely generated. So when you talk about the idea, you don't need, to need this kind of abstract definition. You just think that I have some kind of generating set and I consider this kind of combination that I get an idea. Okay, so, and this S can always be chosen as a finite set. So this is a key point. Any idea in a polynomial ring is finitely generated. Okay, then, okay, this is algebra assigned. So algebra geometry is like a dictionary between algebra and the geometry. It's like EDSFT. We have some kind of, you know, this kind of uh, translation between one field to another field. So one thing, one very, very common question or naive question is we have finite number of polynomials and we try to find the common solution of them. We set all of them to zero, try to solve it. So geometrically, you can say, okay, when you solve this kind of uh, uh, equation system, possibly you get nothing, or you get several points. You get an infinite number of points. You get a curve. You could get a, a surface, hypersurface, anything you can have. So we denote the solution set geometrically as the affine algebraic set. Okay, so that's just a graph. Uh, of this kind of polynomial solutions. We just draw all these kind of points in this uh, affine space Fn. So this is just a graph or the, in the graph of uh, the solution. So this Z, okay, this Z here, that means we try to solve uh, all these kind of polynomials simultaneously and we find the solution, that's a solution set. It's very common that, okay, possibly have too many equations and you don't get any solution, that's okay. In that case, we just say the algebraic set is empty set. Okay. So from the geometry side, we have to define a new kind of topology. This one is not the uh, topology we commonly use for calculus or for complex analysis. So this kind of topology is called Sarisky topology. This topology is very, very strange. So it's very, very different from the normal topology. So here, okay, so first we have this kind of fi space, this fi space fn here. We try to define the closest set, then we define what the topology is. For Sarisky topology, we say, for any kind of algebraic set, algebraic set just the, the solution set of some kind of polynomial system, okay. So for any kind of uh, algebraic set, we say it's a closed set, Sarisky closed. Okay. So why this topology is well defined? Because you can check that if you have, okay, several ideas you know, with this sub subscript uh, little i, if you try to solve them separately and then take the intersection, that's equivalent to say I combine all these kind of ideas all together, okay. And then I solve 
the union of this kind of ideas, okay? So that just means if you have any number of Sarisky closer set, you take the intersection, you still get the Sarisky closer set. So it's self um, consistent. This one, if you have two Sarisky closer set, if you take the union of the two closer set, okay, then you can see, okay, this is from Hutshaw, that is, uh, you take the intersection of the two ideals, okay? And then you take uh, the solution set. Again, that is uh, some kind of solution set. So it's uh, the union of two closed set is also Sarisky closed. So we have a well-defined topology. Okay, but uh, this kind of Sarisky topology is very, very different from the common topology used, okay, like for calculus complex analysis. So here, that's a, a very important uh, example if you say, let's consider one variable is Z, okay, I will consider complex numbers. So if you say, if you do this kind of co complex analysis, you see, we have this D, which is uh, the open disk when the, uh, when the norm of the Z is less than one. So from common topology, definitely D is an open set, it's an open unit disk. However, from the Sarisky viewpoint, it's not a, open. So why is it not open? If you take the complement of the D, then you find this set. This set is the norm of the Z is bigger or equal than one. This one is not so risky closed. Because when you solve the polynomial equation in Z, if it's just one equation, you get a finite number of solutions. If you solve several uh, equations just in one variable Z, okay, then you get a even fewer solutions. Still, there's a finite number of solutions. But that set is definitely not a finite set. So this one is not so risky closed and that one is not so risky open. So here the geometric side we have to uh, jump from calculus or differential geometry or to this kind of risk topology. This is algebra geometry. Okay. So I have to say one thing here. So why do we, uh, why do we uh, define this kind of uh, idea. So the thing is, uh, it seems that equally good if we just uh, use this kind of F1 to FK and solve them all together, find a common solution, all good. But the issue is uh, if you try to solve all this kind of F1 to FK, okay, the common solution, it's equal to the C, I try to solve all the polynomials in this kind of uh, idea, okay, at the same time. Okay, that's very clear because you can see, here, if all this kind of fi equals zero, then no matter how you combine this kind of thing, okay, to get an idea, okay, since fi is already zero, then this can, any kind of combination like this, this is zero. That, that is to say, to solve a polynomial system is equal to say, I try to solve all polynomials in one idea in the same time. Okay, so uh, in the future, we will switch between the two languages. Either we solve find the number of equations, or we say we solve all the equations in one idea. Okay, that's the same thing. Okay, then we go to the geometric. The, uh, another thing I had to comment is uh, here we call it fi algebraic set. So why it's called fi? So of this fi is opposite to projective. So here when we so solve this kind of equations, we are using the ordinary coordinates. When we say the coordinates, it must be a finite number. But in some cases, you want the solution at infinity, then you should not use this kind of definition. You should go to the projective space. In that case, you can define what a, a projective algebra setting is. Okay. So then we go to the geometric side. We define what is a Sarisky closed set. Then the thing is we want to study the decomposition of the closed set. So notice that if you are working with calculus and if you talk about closed set, okay, you try to find the decomposition it's completely meaningless. Okay? Because uh, if you do this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of calculus, you have a lot of freedom okay, to decompose a uh, closed set into many, many uh, close the set, but uh, for the Sarisky topology, Sarisky topology is a very, very tough thing. Okay, you don't find so many different ways to decompose one close the set. So, here I give you one example. Now you have this kind of equation, of course, it's a trivial. You have two variables, two complex variables, the z1, z2. If you solve z1 times z2 equals zero, you get the two three lines when z1 equals zero, z2 equals zero. But immediately you can see that. Uh, 
of course, okay, this cross is Sariska closed, but uh, you can see it can be decomposed decomposed as this kind of vertical line and a horizontal line. And uh, both of the straight lines uh, themselves, they are also Sariski closed. So uh, this Sariski closed set can be decomposed as two Sariski closed sets. So in that sense, you decompose the uh, closed set. So this is very important for algebra geometry. So you have a Sariski closed set, you will try your best to decompose it into the individually closed Sariski set. Okay. So here we say we have the algebra set, which is a solution of many polynomial equations. But uh, uh, eventually, you want to go to something deeper, you want to study each component. So each component is also some certain set of a polynomial. Uh, collection of polynomials. So this is the decomposition of the Sarsky closed set. So if you find one closed Sarsky closed set which cannot be decomposed, then this one is called a variety, irreducible Sarsky closed set. Okay. So basically, the whole classical part of algebra geometry is trying to study the relation between idea and the variety. Okay, so you try to find the dictionary between these two things and you get the classical part of algebra geometry. But of course, the modern algebra geometry is much more abstract than that. So why here we do this kind of decomposition? Because frequently uh, you solve some kind of uh, uh, polynomial equations, you find that so you get infinite number of solutions. In that case, you want to look at it carefully. So possibly it looks some high degree high degree equation, but it get decomposed. Then you can see each component is a very simple equation. Then you understand it good. Or sometimes you say, okay, here, okay, that's decomposed. But uh, maybe one component is a very simple, it's a rational. The other one is complicated. It's not say it's a elliptic curve, it's very possible. So it's very important that in the beginning you get this kind of solution set, but uh, geometrically you can decompose that to the varieties. But uh, here's uh, some concepts. I didn't say how you can really do this kind of decomposition. Beyond the two dimension, you can very, very, uh, there's a very, very difficult to really draw the picture. So in that case, you can't just rely on this kind of graph to do the decomposition. You need some more advanced tool called primary decomposition to do this. So that's something I'm going to introduce in the second lecture. So here, okay, the relation between the idea and the, the variety. So the first thing I'm going to introduce, the first theorem is called a weak here of the long standing sense. So long standing sense means the zero point theorem. So that's uh, one thing very, very important is for this kind of a polynomial equation system or this idea It's very likely that there's no solution at all. So in this case, what can you say about it? So the Hilbert theorem um, tells you that if you have I, which is the idea of, uh, uh, sorry, this should be square bracket. This F square bracket F1 to Fn, this polynomial ring, and this F is uh, algebraic closed. So it's very, very important that the field is algebraic closed. So which field is algebraic closed? So this complex field is algebraic closed, but the rational field is not. Uh, this finite field, Z over P, that one is not algebraic closed, but you can definitely define an algebraic closure of it to make it algebraic closed. Okay. So, if you try to get a very rough idea of algebraic geometry, you'd better start with some kind of algebraic closed because algebraic closed, any kind of one variable polynomial equation, you must find a solution. But if you work with uh, uh, Q is a rational number, they have a lot of difficulties, like uh, X squared minus two, do you have a solution or not? It has a solution, but the solution is not rational, all these kind of difficulties. So algebraic geometry always starts with the simple one with C or some kind of algebraic closure of the uh, finite field. And then you get some theorem, but for the real computation, possibly you don't want to work with C. Okay, C is too complicated, okay. And uh, you want to work with Q, so you need some kind of deep theorem to work with Q. But right now, just to start with C, the simplest one, is uh, uh, complex number first. So let's just assume here F is a complex complex number field, and F is algebraic closed. Any kind of a long trivial one variable polynomial equation has a solution. Uh, 
Okay, so here what um, told us that if you try to solve this idea, you find the common zero point, you don't get anything empty set, then this idea is generated by one. That means one, this number one, okay, it's also polynomial, trivial polynomial, is inside the idea. Actually, if you say if an idea contains this number one, then, okay, you say this one can generate any kind of polynomial. So when you say bracket one, it just means uh, this uh, bracket one is the whole polynomial ring. That means uh, if you find that uh, one idea has no solution at all, that just means this idea is the whole thing, the whole polynomial ring. So this one is a little bit surprising, this result. So I give you some kind of uh, examples. Okay, this example are very, very trivial. Let's consider f equals c. Okay, it's complex number field. You try to uh, consider the common solution of these two polynomials. Then you can do some very simple computation and easily find that there's no solution. Because uh, right now you have two equations in one variable. You try that, they don't have common solution. It's an empty set. And then you do some algebra, you can find that, okay, this is the first generator, the second generator. With some kind of polynomial coefficients, you can get a one. Then you verify the here with the theorem. Okay. For some multivariable case, now you have two variables, three equations, and also it's like that there's no solution at all. And then you can see there's a first generator, second generator, third generator. And then you can do some kind of clever math with this kind of coefficient and also get one. That means one is in this idea, which means all polynomials are in the idea. Okay. So that means uh, it's like that you find some kind of uh, idea has no solution, but this idea is very, very special. The one is inside and the idea is a whole polynomial ring. The last one is a counter example. Now you try to solve x squared minus two. Do you get a solution in Q? Don't get a square solution in Q because the solution is plus minus two. Uh, in this case, okay, you may say that in Q they don't have a solution because the solution is irrational. Okay, you can say it's an empty set, but that one does not give you this result because it does not satisfy the requirement of the here of the last sentence. This Q is not algebra closed, so this one does not tell you anything. Okay, so be very careful with Q. So this theorem gives you some basic idea about this kind of algebra geometry that tells you that, okay, from the condition when you don't find any solution, then the idea is very, very special. It's just the idea generated by one. Here, okay, that is the algebra geometry. But what Gabrielli, is the... sorry to interrupt. Gabrielli has a question. Hi, hi. Um, sorry, could you repeat um, the first example a bit? So we, we want to verify that the the ideal is uh, it's it's one. So I, I didn't understood the like how the the reasoning works. Yeah. So so this idea, okay, have two equations. We want to solve the two equations together, find the common solution. But numerically, you don't find any solution. Okay. Because there are two equations in yeah. one, one variable. Numerically, you can easily check that there's no solution. But uh, so what, what about the next line? So, so this one also numerically. No, 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 yeah, the, the, what, so uh, you say if I numerically verify the, uh, there is no solution, I know the the deal is, uh, is empty. But uh, the, the, the very next line, what, what, what does it mean? What I mean is you want to say something about the idea generated by the three, by this kind of three generators. You want to say what is the, the idea is. So just like a linear algebra, linear algebra have several generating vectors, but possibly they are linearly dependent. Okay, they are not good basis. Then you try to do some kind of organization, some Gaussian elimination, some kind of Graham Schmidt organization to find a very nice basis. So here is similar thing. I have an idea generated by three generators, but these generators are maybe misleading. I try to find a good basis. A good basis is one. So that means one can be generated by the three generators. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. So so I just need to verify that one is one element one element in the in the idea and, and I'm done. Yes, by the three, by the three generators. Okay. So that means if you want yeah. to represent this idea, just put the one here, okay. One is a good generator, this three, they are generators, but the better generators. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So um, the role of the computational algebra geometry is different from this uh, theorem. The theorem is purely mathematical. The thing is, uh, at that time, mathematicians 
didn't care about what the coefficient is. They just the existence theorem. You say, okay, if you're from this generators, you can get one. But it didn't tell you how to get this kind of coefficients. So the role of computational algebra geometry is try to find this kind of coefficient to do some computational work. Actually, it's not an easy task to get this kind of numbers. Okay, then let's turn to the Hilbert Lance Tennant sense. So previously we talked about a very special case where you find, uh, okay, there's no common solution empty set. And you can see what can we say about idea. So here I say, suppose that for the general case, we find some solutions. Okay, I find a, a, a solution. Okay, then the thing is, what can we say about this idea? So let's consider, consider this fi space Fn here. Suppose we have a set U in this fi, this fi space. Then we try to say, okay, we want to find the defining polynomials of this set. Actually, we find that for any point in this U, we find the, the polynomial vanishing on all the point P, okay, the P uh, as for any point on this U. Okay, so that's a, it's a, I given some kind of point set, I want to find the, uh, the polynomial set which uh, are vanishing on every point of this U. So this is the reversed operation comparing with the Z, this one is called the I's. So the thing is, you may think that this dictionary is very simple. I have an idea, I take the uh, zero points, I get some kind of point sets, and then I take uh, the I, I call the idea of this, uh, uh, this U here, okay? So you can easily check all this kind of F in itself, they form an idea. Okay. You may naively think that uh, i, z, i equals z, and i is the inverse operation of z, but it's not the case. So one very simple count example is, I consider a very simple case, complex number f equals c, okay, then you consider the idea, which is uh, x squared. Okay. Then you solve this equation x squared equals zero. That's just one solution, zero. But then you, you take the idea of zero, then you find that uh, okay, what kind of equation is definitely vanishing uh, on the, this zero point. Then you find that x of course is one and also all the polynomials multiplied by x. Then you can say so I, this is ideal, this ideal is, okay. Okay, I'm sorry about it. I'm sorry, I have some problem with my, my keynote to restart it here. Okay. So let's back to this example. I say, I want to find all polynomials to vanish at the point of zero. Of course, it's the idea generated by X as it means all polynomials multiplied by X. But I can see this one is uh, all polynomials multiplied by X squared. This is all polynomials multiplied by x. They are not the same idea. So this i is not simply an inverse of z here. So this, uh, this uh, assumption is wrong. So we need to hear about the last sense. So that, that is, uh, if you say, okay, if you say that uh, I have one idea, I find this kind of zi, the common solution set. If I have another polynomial, f is vanishing on all points of the solution set. Do you think F is inside of I? Actually not. But here but, uh, told you that there exists some pos positive integer key such that F key is inside this kind of idea. That means this guess is almost correct, but you have to be very, very careful with this kind of multiplicity because there's a square here, okay. So if you find uh, some polynomial really vanishing at X does not mean this polynomial is inside the I, but uh, if you can raise the power to, okay, to some kind of integer power K here, then when K is big enough, it's inside the idea. So this one is called here with the long standard sense. So that tells you that you solve this kind of idea, you get certain sets and you try to find the polynomials vanishing on this one. So with this kind of power here, okay, then you can see this F is just almost, almost in this kind of idea. Oh, in the mathematical language, uh, 
given this kind of idea in the polynomial ring, we can define the radical idea of i. So you can say that, uh, of course, this uh, radical idea is a superset of i. That is also an idea. That is, uh, we don't need f is really inside of i, but f some positive power is in i. So this one is uh, some has some kind of flexibility here. This one is a bigger set than i, and uh, this uh, radical i itself, you can prove the idea. Then here, but Langston tell you that if you first take the common solution of some idea, and then you have this point set, you find the polynomials of vanishing on this point set, then you almost get an i, but you can actually get to this kind of little bit bigger set is called the radical idea of i, okay. So this is the conceptual part of it. I'm sorry, this part is uh, uh, very, very compressed. Okay, so very, very mathematical. Possibly you need one week to really understand these slides. Okay. But anyway, we, we go to the computational side. Okay. So besides this kind of very basic algebra geometry 101, okay, this classical algebra geometry, you want to solve some real problems. So first, that's the idea of membership. If you, uh, have some kind of uh, uh, idea, then you say, I have another polynomial. Can you tell me if the polynomial is inside the idea or not? Okay, that's a one question. It's just like, uh, okay, I have some kind of polynomial system, like a scattering equation system. Now I have some kind of polynomial. You tell me that if I really can solve the scattering equation, it's not so easy to solve the scattering equation. Is this target polynomial is really everywhere zero on the solution set, that's a trivial thing, you can drop it. Okay. So it's called idea membership problem. Another one is the idea identification. Now, very likely you have two kinds of polynomial equation systems and you can solve both. But the thing is before you try to solve both, you want to see are they equivalent or not? Can you somehow, before you really numerically solve this polynomial equation system, just from algebra geometry to uh, determine if they are these two are the same, that's very important. Like scattering equation, you can write uh, many, many different, different uh, versions of scattering equations, but before you try to solve them, what we want to see, are they really the same thing? Another thing is this kind of here of long sense computation. You find that uh, one polynomial equation system has no solution. Then you say, okay, by the here of the weak long sense, you can find that all the polynomial should be combined to one. That means uh, somewhere there's a contradiction because you can't put one equal zero. You want to say where the contradiction is. So in this case, you need the coefficient I just mentioned for the weak long standing sense. Okay. So in that case, to get the coefficients is not a theoretical question, but a computational question. And also something called a variable elimination. You have the polynomial system, okay, but uh, you don't like this, this kind of variables because uh, you, you maybe you just want to focus on one variable, forget about the other variables. You want to reduce the system from a multivariable problem to one variable problem. So you want to eliminate all the other variables. Or if you want to change the variables, you want to redefine the variables along nearly. Okay, so that's not an easy linear algebra problem. In this case, you need some computational tools to do the elimination. And eventually, of course, you want to solve the polynomial system. Okay, so all these kind of things are practical questions I'm going to talk about in the first one or two lectures, computational algebra geometry. So uh, I think I finished this nice and then we have a break. So let's go very, very, okay, uh, very, very back talk about some kind of high school math. So suppose we have our algebra geometry, that's only one variable. And when we can also define the idea, but suppose they are all uh, this, uh, this kind of principal idea, this idea generated by only one generator. So if you ask me, okay, can you use some high school math to solve the idea of membership problem? For example, you have one variable X, you have this very simple idea generated by one generator X minus three, you want to determine if this polynomial is inside this idea or not. How do you do that? So by the definition, if it's inside this idea, that means uh, this one is a multiplier of it. So you can do some high school math to do this kind of Euclidean division, check the remainder and tell me, okay, if the remainder is zero, then of course this one is in the idea. If the remainder is not zero, then it's not in this idea. So for one variable, one polynomial equation is uh, somehow solved in the high school math. So this one is called Euclidean division algorithm. So the thing is uh, for the computational side, okay. So the basic tool to do this kind of computation is uh, the polynomial division. 
Okay, so the, the thing here is we have this kind of multivariable case. We also have this kind of multi uh, polynomial case. So in that case, uh, you have to generalize the polynomial division okay, to the more complicated situations. So the key here is uh, for the polynomial division, the very important thing is we can learn from the high school math is uh, we have to give an ordering of the monomials. So we always say this is a monomial, the monomial, monomial, monomial. We always say that we give an ordering, naive ordering. So the higher degree uh, monomial is higher. The lower degree monomial is lower. Then we sort the polynomials of monomials from higher to lower. And then, okay, in the first step, you say this highest one is x cubic. This is x. We want uh, some kind of quotient to cancel this highest monomial. Okay, so the key point for this division is the monomial ordering. If we can generalize this kind of one variable trivial ordering to the multivariable case, then basically we have some computational tools. I think I stop here and possibly we have maybe five minutes break. Okay, now we come back. I think it's almost the time to restart, isn't it? I've started the recording again. Okay, great. Okay, so okay, so we have to be quick. So, uh, you know, this algebra geometry is a huge subject. Okay, if you really want to get something, then you have to somehow uh, really do some computation by yourself. Okay, and also read uh, some of the references I just said. So here we see for the one variable case. Uh, one variable one polynomial equation case, okay, this kind of algebra geometry um, actually is almost, almost solved by the high school math. Now go to the multivariable case, that's a hard one. So let's consider a ring with uh, x1 to xn, so we have n variables. So we try to define this kind of monomial ordering. So first of all, this kind of monomial ordering is a little bit arbitrary, okay. So we just want this a total order ordering, that means any kind of monomial, if they are different, we can really compare which one is the higher, which one is the lower. Okay, just uh, uh, give it a brute force ordering for it. And we want this ordering to respect the product. If uh, this V is already higher than U, then multiply by anything, any kind of monomial, then this ordering is still kept. And we want uh, any kind of uh, long constant monomial is higher than the one. Okay, so make sure one is the lowest uh, monomial. So, uh, traditionally, we have several orderings. One is the lexical graphic ordering. Okay, so uh, this kind of thing you don't need to really remember it. It's, uh, everything is in mathematics. Okay, so this is the lexical graphic ordering. So what is lexical graphic? That means uh, you have n variables. Okay, so you first give a, a rough ordering. You say x one is larger than x two, x two is larger than x three, and uh, this uh, this uh, actually this is z. Okay. Z minus one is larger than Z n here. Okay, this is just something arbitrary. You can just uh, commute it whatever you want. And then we have uh, two monomials with some arbitrary power here. So next graphic means you first uh, compare this uh, Z one power. Okay, if this alpha one is less than beta one, then you just uh, call G two is higher than G one. You don't need to worry about all the rest, all dropped. You here is a tire, then you continue to compare this kind of alpha two and beta two. If still there's a tire, then you compare alpha three and alpha three, so it's a lexical graphic. But this one, okay, is uh, something very, very arbitrary because uh, you really focus on the first uh, variable. This one almost uh, determines everything. So. Uh, a better one is a degree lexicographic. That means you first compare the total degree. So you first sum over all the alpha, sum over all the beta. If the second sum is larger than the first sum, then you say the second monomial is higher than the first one. So the degree lexicographic. Uh, this one is better. And uh, something even better is called a degree reversed lexical graphic. So that's not something so important. It's very, very similar to degree, uh, this kind of degree lexical graphic. That is, uh, you first compare the, the total degree and uh, get a result. If there's a tile, instead of comparing 
the first one, then you go back to compare the last one. Okay. And if you compare the last one, you get some results. So here reverse it. If alpha n is uh, lower than the beta n, then call g1 is higher than g2. So it's called a reversed. So this is a degree reversed next to graphical ordering. So uh, these two are almost the same, but in the future you can say you can feel free to choose which one, but actually this is a better, you, you will see why this one is the better. So this is the best order you can use, degree reverse next to uh, graphic. Sometimes you can also use a block ordering. You have n variables, but you then split that into several sets. Okay, so inside each set, you give a, a monomial ordering and then combine them all together. You just say, uh, Given this kind of uh, variables, I have some kind of monomial to some power. I forget about uh, all the rest blocks. I just uh, do this kind of uh, monomial ordering comparison in the first block. When this one, we get a complete tile, then go to the second block. So why do I do this? I do this that is uh, frequently we have some cases we want to have nonlinear change of variables. So we can say this set of variable, that's something I really dislike. So the basic feeling is if you dislike some variable, you put it to the higher, uh, to this kind of higher ordering. If you like some kind of monomial, then you put it lower. So the whole idea of this kind of polynomial division is try to cancel out the high degree monomial. So something you don't like, you put it high. If you don't like several, you just put that in one block and you say in the future, I try to eliminate all the variables in this block. Okay, so this is the definition of the monomial ordering. So let's go to mathematics. So uh, almost everything is in mathematics. So here we have a polynomial that have several monomials. Now I have x, y, z, this is three variables. When I say this uh, curly bracket x, y, z, okay, from the mathematical convention, that just means x is already higher than y, y is already higher than z. So from left to right, higher to lower. So first I can consider the monomial list sorted by the lexical graphic. So that it really is, I try to compare the X power first. I forget about the Y power for a while. So you can see by this sorting higher in the front. So you can see X is actually higher than the Y square. It's very, very strange. This is a square, but this is X. But since we are doing this kind of lexical graphic ordering, so we only compare the x power first. So this is a, has a linear power, this one has zero power. So this one is higher than that, no matter how high the y power is. So this is only useful in cases you really dislike this x. You want to try your best to get rid of this x and use this next to graphic order x, y, z. But the degree next to graphic is something more nature than this. You can say, okay, you have this y square, where y square definitely higher than x because this is a quadratic power. This one is a linear power here. Okay, so you first compare uh, the total degree and then you do this kind of next to graphic comparison. So this is, is uh, the uh, different one. This is uh, very similar, but the degree reverse next to graphic. So the basic thing is uh, similar, but you get a slightly different one, still the quadratic one in front. I can see here there's some kind of uh, subtlety between which one is higher, this xz is higher, or y square uh, is uh, higher. Okay, because for degree reverse, it will look at the z power first. And when they say there's a z power one here, they put it to lower. Okay. The last one, so actually, uh, there's a one disadvantage of using mathematics because it does not have the uh, very easy to use block ordering. The block ordering actually is something very, very useful but you can somehow define your weight matrix and then you can get whatever order you want. So this is a, a weight matrix. So what's the meaning of that? So you can say for any kind of monomial, it has uh, three powers in X, Y, and Z. So for the powers, I take the inner product with this vector, I get number. I compare this number first, I compare that number, compare that number. This number just means I only take the power of x, compare the power of x. Only when this is a tire, compare the second number. This number just means I compare the total degree of y and z. So for x, okay, for x itself, I'm doing this kind of graphic. Okay. Uh, very brute force. 
compare the x power first, but when there's a tile and then I do a degree, uh, reverse the next graphic for y and z. Okay, so this is a block order. It has two blocks. One is x, one is y and z. So all these things are in mathematics. So you can use all this kind of ordering, but sometimes you have to write down explicit matrix like this. Okay, then with this kind of uh, uh, ordering, we can define what is uh, the multivariable and the multi-polynomial division. So this algorithm is very, very clear. This one is just a generalization of this algorithm here. Okay, I have some kind of highest term I divide by some polynomial cancel the highest and then I have next highest and then I try to cancel it until that I find that I get some very low uh, uh, monomial which is not divided by any of this kind of divisor. So then I stop. But here there's some subtlety. So first you have to make sure that this uh, ordering is uh, fixed in the beginning. If you can change the ordering okay, in the intermediate step, then the result is meaningless. You have to fix the monomial ordering in the beginning. And don't forget, you have uh, an idea of several generators, F1 to Fk. Then you have to see whatever step when I try to do this kind of uh, polynomial division, I pick up one divisor, do the division, and then I try to see, okay, for the uh, next the highest uh, monomial, can I find another degree, another uh, divisor, try to cancel the next the highest monomial, okay? You do all these kind of steps in a loop. And eventually you find that get some R here. This R, okay, this is a reminder. That is, this R is not divided by any kind of a divisor. There's no way to get uh, the, uh, monomial in the R even lower than you stop. So this one is a well-defined algorithm, okay? And uh, definitely this one can be done in polynomial time. So it's a simple algorithm. However, this algorithm, okay, uh, is not something so useful. So this is simple generalization from one variable to several variable cannot solve the classical algebra geometry problems. I tell you why, because there's some kind of ambiguity in this algorithm. When you try to say, okay, I have this kind of target F, capital F, I try to uh, divide by this kind of device Fi, I compare the leading term, leading term LT, LT is the leading term, it's the highest monomial. I try to cancel the highest monomial, but uh, the thing is I have F1 to Fk. So here I have an uh, ambiguity, I say Fi, I can pick up F1, I can pick up F2. So it's a very, very, Unfortunate um, that uh, the result is not unique. If you first pick up or divide by F1 or divide by F2, the result could be completely different. So although it's an algorithm, but as output is not something so useful. I give you one very simple example in mathematics. Now you have one idea of two generators called polynomial set. I have this kind of input uh, monomial x squared, y squared. I divide by this polynomial set, actually you see two divisors. And uh, I have this kind of well-defined monomial order degree reverse next to graphic. So X also this uh, bracket means X is higher than Y. I do the division and it's very fast. I get uh, this kind of uh, remainder here by polynomial reduce. So you can see this one, you get uh, Y to the fourth I is as the remainder. Okay, this is uh, one output. But if you say I change the ordering of this polynomial set, actually the ordering is completely useless because when I solve these polynomial equations, I find a common solution. I don't worry about the, which equation is the first F1, which equation F2. So if I reverse it, I do the division, I get something completely different. They're all correct, but they are different. So this output is something meaningless. Okay. Although it's very, very fast, but uh, this division, you try to say that I divide by two polynomials, get a reminder, it's meaningless. Okay. So another thing is it doesn't solve any problem. So again, you say x minus y, x plus y minus y, x minus two, these three linear equations, they have no common solution. Okay, numerically, can easily find it, or linear algebra, you they find it. So by here, put the long, uh, this here with the weak long sentence, you would say that this number one should be in this kind of idea. Then you may naively think that I have this input uh, polynomial one divided by this one, I can say I should get a reminder zero, which means one is inside that. However, it's not the case. 
if you put a one here, uh, divide by that, you find that the, all the quotients, they are just a zero. Okay, nothing is done, and the remainder is just the input. So actually no computation is done. So although this kind of polynomial reduce or polynomial division, uh, it's a very good uh, algorithm, but does not solve any real problem. So in this case, uh, you need a new ingredient. So this uh, new ingredient is a new thing, okay, which is uh, from uh, the 1970s called a global basis. Then with global basis, all these kind of problems can be fixed. So global basis. So you can see where the problem is. So here we try to do this kind of ideal membership problem by trying to say proof one is really inside uh, this idea. But the thing is by the algorithm, no matter how you choose this kind of monomial ordering, one, okay, the leading term is also one, is already lower than the lead, any of the leading term here. Because here are all the leading terms are some kind of variable, free variable. So actually you cannot cancel any of this kind of uh, highest monomial in the input polynomial. So in this case, the division is completely useless. So what's wrong? What's wrong here is uh, this is an idea, okay, but just like a linear algebra, for linear algebra, you have some kind of uh, generating vectors, but they could be linearly dependent. Okay, then you need some kind of Gaussian elimination to get a good basis, well-defined, well, not just well-defined, a nice basis can really say, okay, like the dimension, uh, of the space. So this one, although they are correct generators, that's misleading. You use the three ones to represent this idea as misleading, it's generating set. So group of basis basically is a good generating set uh, of the idea. So what is group of basis? So we have this kind of field. We have this kind of phenomenal ring for any idea here. So first the group of basis is uh, also a generating set for I, but it has a very, very good property. The property is uh, this GI, they are very simple, okay, simple or low degree or simple uh, polynomials such that uh, given any kind of F in this idea, there always exists some of this GI in the global basis such that the leading term of GI just the device, just the divides the leading term of F. Okay, so this is called a global basis. It sounds very, very abstract, okay, but uh, uh, just uh, trust me, this one is a uh, nonlinear. This is a uh, nonlinear uh, generalization of the Gaussian elimination. Okay, so I want a good okay, generating set of the vector space. So we get to this kind of Gaussian elimination. So here I want to get a good nonlinear uh, generating set for the idea that is global basis. So global basis was invented by Buchebrook actually. But the name, okay, was from his supervisor, uh, Grubler. The other thing is you really need to do some computation. You cannot just define something called a global basis. Only with the development of the computer techniques that you can really do some computation with global basis. So the, before I really go to the global basis, I will try to say what a good global basis is. Okay. So the good thing for the global basis is uh, if you do the polynomial division over a global basis instead of uh, an arbitrary generating set, then the remainder is actually unique. No matter which f, which f you divide first, then you get a well-defined result of the remainder. If you, uh, if you have this kind of f, which is an arbitrary polynomial, if you divide um, it over the global basis, you find the, the remainder is just a zero, then you can say, okay, this F is really inside the idea. And the vice versa, if you say F is inside this idea, only if F divided by the global basis, you get a zero remainder. So by this one, by the algorithm, you can really, okay, determine if this F is inside this idea or not. You don't need to really numerically find the, all the solutions of the idea, okay, that's a very, very, time consuming, but then you just say, I get a group basis, and then I say, I just F, I divide by group basis, if I get zero, then definitely this F is uh, inside the idea. If uh, the reminder is something else, it's one or something like X plus one or something polynomial on zero polynomial, then definitely this F is not in this kind of idea. Okay, and then, okay, in the next lecture, I will say that this group basis and also the division give you a canonical representation of this quotient ring.
Uh, sorry to interrupt. Carlos has a question. Do you want to unmute yourself, Carlos? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Um, I think yes. second one should be F in I. The second point should be if. Oh, yes. Uh, it's a type. I'm sorry, it's F in I. Yes, F in I. Sorry. I was thinking of the generic polynomial. This is F in I. I will change it and upload it. Yes. Okay, good. Great. Yes, F in I. Second one is F in I. Okay, so the first one is uh, you want to compare two ideas. I want to compare uh, two polynomials. So to do this, you just uh, fix a monomial order. You can prove that the reduced, okay, the reduced group basis is unique. If, uh, uh, the two ideas are really the same, even they are represented by different generators. But if you do the reduced group basis computation, you have got the unique answer. Then you can just compare the group basis to see they are really the same uh, idea. So you can see just by the good properties of group basis, you can solve two problems. One is idea membership problem, and one is idea identification problem. So in the future, I will give you more uh, applications about group basis. But right now, let's just go to the book book algorithm. So you don't need to really, okay, think of this kind of group basis uh, algorithm too much. Just think that, okay, you have this kind of uh, linear algebra problem, you have matrix, you have uh, many rows, but you know these rows are linearly dependent. Then you, find, you try to find a simple representation of the sublinear space. So what do you do? You do Gaussian elimination, and then you get a, uh, two vectors, you compare the uh, the first entry okay, of the first vector, you compare the second entry of, uh, you, you also compare the uh, first entry of the second vector. Okay, if, if they are both non zero, then you can cancel, uh, cancel them. You, you can remove uh, the first entry of the second vector. Then you can uh, gradually make the matrix as a triangular matrix. And then you can see which one is really dependent, which one is independent, you get a good basis. You get a good representation uh, of the linear subspace. So here is the same thing. Now you have this kind of bad generating set F1 to Fn here. Okay, you also do something very similar to Gaussian elimination. So for two F, this Fi and Fg, you can com compute the so-called S pair. You have this kind of, uh, Fi, you have this kind of Fj here. You know that multiplied by the leading term of Fj subtracts this leading term of Fi, then should cancel uh, the highest term okay, in the two polynomials. But uh, you can also do something even better because uh, it could be these uh, two leading terms have some common factors. You can divide by this kind of GCD of the common factor. So by doing this, you cancel the highest terms of the two polynomials. Just like the Gaussian elimination, you always try to cancel the leftmost elements of two vectors. So given this F1 to Fn here, then you can uh, calculate this S pair, and then you just uh, add this kind of S pair. Uh, so first, okay, for S, S pair, you do the polynomial division, try to get the remainder, and then add the remainder into this pool of the generating set. Okay, and then you continue to do this until you find at uh, one point, no matter how you generate more, more and more S pairs, after the, this kind of division over the generating set, you always get a zero. Then you stop. Okay. It's proven this kind of book book algorithm will always stop. Okay. Uh, so the group basis always exists. So this one just to give you the group basis. Uh, but uh, sometimes you, you want to reduce the group basis. That is, I try to somehow trim the group basis. I want to find a minimal subset of it, which is also group basis. This one can also be easily done if you just look at. Uh, uh, this kind of suppose B is a regular basis. Then you just say if uh, one polynomial's leading term divides another polynomial's leading term, then you know that one of this generator should be removed. Okay, so this is a book book algorithm, the classical algorithm, and the first algorithm of group basis. So this one uh, is very simple, but actually it's a very very uh, expensive algorithm because uh, instead of doing Linear algebra, if you do Gaussian elimination, that one can be definitely finished in uh, polynomial time. But this one is not. The reason this one is not is uh, here is a nonlinear question. You cannot control the degree increase 
okay, of this kind of uh, polynomials, especially if you have uh, several variables, it's uh, very difficult to predict how high in the intermediate step the, uh, the degree is. So eventually you can find that this one is not in polynomial time. I actually can prove in the worst case, it's double exponential in the number of variables. So it's actually a very, very difficult algorithm, although it looks simple. However, for the general case, it's not double exponential. And in many cases, it is solvable. And especially for the practical purpose, for many kinds of physics problems, this kind of global basis can be solvable. But of course, you can say this algorithm can be optimized in many, many different ways. So here, of course, you can see I compare this, I do this kind of S pair computation and then put it into a pool. Now, of course, I can consider some parallelization. I calculate a lot of S pairs, do the reduction at the same time I put it into the pool. But all these kind of things are still some modified uh, book book algorithm. But there's some also much better algorithm, F4 algorithm, F5 algorithm, which is not. Uh, uh, introduced here. That's uh, also not in mathematics. You can try to use some other program to do it. But right now, let's stick with the book book algorithm, although it's very slow. So book book algorithm is uh, uh, in mathematics. Okay. So you can say that uh, for again this example, these three generators has no solution. I want to find a better. Uh, generating set of it. So I can run something called global basis in mathematics. So I put the polynomial set of one, I put X higher than Y, I use the DRL ordering. So immediately the program tells us that the generating set is just one element, it's just one, okay. So this is my like Gaussian relation. So this generating set is bad. So I get a better one, it's one. Immediately this example, uh, tells us this one is inside this idea. So this equation system definitely has no solution at all. We can also do some other cases, like x minus one, x, y, minus y plus one, some random polynomial. You can also get a group basis. So this way I don't get one. Okay, and actually you can easily say one is not in this kind of idea. So that is, uh, you have some kind of solutions with this equation system. We can also consider the polynomial division uh, this example, I said that if you naively divide by polynomial set, then the result is not unique, not well defined. But divide by a group of basis, then you can see I get uh, something, okay, very, very stable. It's always minus y. And the better thing is uh, start from this uh, degree four, okay, polynomial, I get this degree one polynomial. I really get some kind of simplification. Okay, that's very important. So if you naively divide by that, remember, you get something y to the power force. So it's not good division. So this one not just unique, you get a simple result. Okay, so in the future, okay, uh, maybe you can forget all this kind of mathematical introduction, but uh, uh, first remember these two comments, this group of basis and uh, uh, this polynomial reduce, okay, it will give you very, very powerful to it's almost a generalization of this kind of high school Euclidean division to the multi-variable, uh, multi-divisor case. And uh, uh, also don't forget that here you have to put some kind of a monomial order, monomial order here. Okay, let's see one application, let's turn to Felix. So one application is so-called integrand reduction. You have this kind of finite integral here. Suppose that we already did a, uh, some kind of polarization, decomposition, so this n is really a scalar. But uh, it could be a high uh, degree scalar, so this could be like a L1 dot some p here to some power 4, or this kind of scalar, high degree scalar. So the very first thing we want to do is to do an e integral reduction. So you want to say we have a very complicated numerator, either from five my rules or from entirety, very complicated, very high degree. I try to say I try to uh, decompose this numerator to two parts. One part is uh, definitely proportional to this uh, denominator. So if it's proportional denominator, then, then this part cancel one of the denominator. So the diagram uh, shrunk to some kind of a simpler sub diagram. Then we can do it recursively for this kind of simple diagram. That's some reminder here, something we really want to deal with. But the goal is that we want to re, uh, 
move as many terms as possible to the first part, to a sub diagram and put some very simple terms to the irreducible term. So this one exactly is the ideal membership problem. So the thing here is if you really say, I have this N, the naively polynomial uh, reduce divided by D1 to Dm, I get a reminder. So you really don't get something useful because uh, it depends on the ordering you are using. And uh, also this D1 to Dm is not, not a good generating set. Possibly their leading terms are too high. Then the division will stop very, very quickly. We don't get anything. So the idea here is as from some old paper, okay, uh, one by myself, the other one is uh, uh, by the Munich group at that time. That was uh, to consider the group basis of this uh, denominator, this kind of uh, denominator set D1 to Dm, get a, uh, uh, get a group basis, and then you do the division. Then you could get the best effect, you can move as many terms as possible to the quotient, to the sub diagram, and get something really, really irreducible, really, really not in this kind of idea. And uh, uh, this kind of delta is a reminder, the leading terms are actually lower than any kind of leading term in the group basis. That's the best uh, integrand reduction effort you can get. So here, let's turn to some diagram. So one diagram is a very simple result. Okay. So consider this kind of D dimension, we use the dimensional regularization. Okay, so you have six propagators. But how many variables do you have? You consider this kind of dimensional regularization, you definitely for this L. You have, for one L, you have four variables in the 4D, but for the extra dimension, you can use an overall uh, variable for the norm of the um, overall direction videos, because we are talking about scaling integrals, so this kind of uh, angular direction band matter. So we have actually only five variables. But then you have six denominators. Generically, you have six equations and uh, five variables generically don't have any solution. So by here, the last sentence says, if you don't have a solution, that means uh, one is inside this idea. All you can see the global basis is just one. There's only one element. This one is in global basis. If one is in group basis, that's very good. One is in group basis. So when you do this kind of division, so everything is, a divide, uh, is dividable. So everything can be moved to this kind of quotient and you don't have kind of any kind of irreducible term here. So that means uh, you can remove all the terms to sub diagrams. So that means uh, for the one loop of dimensional regularization, we don't need a hexagon diagram. Just by some algebra, even we don't need any physics, we don't have we don't need this kind of hexagon diagram. This can be simply decomposed into pentagon, box, triangle, whatever sub diagram you have. Okay. Uh, this is, a, of course, is a very simple application of the field of long-standing sense of Google basis. But uh, uh, something non-trivial, you can see our paper a while ago, that is to consider the real computation is a tool of 500 or plus uh, global amplitude. So we do this kind of integrand. The integrand is from the entirety, but still it's complicated. But then the thing is, uh, if you use this kind of uh, uh, global basis and do this kind of uh, division properly, you can somehow nicely arrange uh, all these kind of uh, terms in the amplitude as eight diagrams with some color factors, very simple result. So this is the integrand reduction and uh, this kind of ideal membership, they all solved by this global basis. Let's turn to something tricky. This idea identification. Okay, so in many cases, we want to determine if two ideas are the same. Then, uh, if you really just look at it, it's not so easy. Okay, and if you tr really try to numerically solve it, it's a very hard, heavy computation, and numerical work could be very, very unstable. So, the correct thing to do is to copy the Google basis. So, I give you a very simple example. Okay. Uh, of course, this uh, example is very, very trivial. Okay. So the example is uh, you have this kind of idea. You want to prove this idea is permutationally invariant. That means if you do any kind of permutation, then of course it seems that all the equations are changed. But the thing is uh, you want to prove that after one permutation, do you get a new idea or do you get something else, a new idea? So, here, 
uh, to do this, of course, for the permutation itself, you can just say it's a very simple S3 permutation. You just say, I can use this kind of uh, replacement in mathematics. Then after the permutation, you get six ideas. They all look very different because uh, each uh, polynomial looks uh, very, very uh, unsymmetric. So you don't see any feature of it. So after permutation, you get whatever random polynomials you have. But the thing is, don't worry about that. After the permutation, put it to global basis, okay? This is the global basis for the unpermuted result. You get this global basis. You can see after this non-trivial permutation, uh, definitely the generating set looks quite different, but the complete global basis get the same idea, okay? So that means that after this permutation, uh, the idea is invariant. But actually you can see that after all the permutations that's invariant. So although this idea looks quite, quite random, and the long of the polynomial looks very symmetric on the permutation, but the whole idea itself is uh, symmetric. That is useful because sometimes then when you do integrability, when you talk about beta, this kind of beta answers equation, you know, the beta roots, they are all symmetric. But uh, if you look at the uh, individual equation, it does not look so symmetric, but this method quickly tell you that uh, it's completely symmetric. Okay, so about the elimination theory, so I, I think that today I'm just going to finish with this kind of elimination theory. So elimination theory means uh, if you have this kind of polynomial ring with two sets of polynomials, it's y1 to ym, z1 to zn, you really dislike this kind of y1 to ym. So in this case, you have this kind of idea, some polynomials, in, not just in z, but also in y, but you really don't like this kind of y. So you try your best to eliminate all the y's uh, in terms of this. So this one, if you don't have all this kind of algebra geometry tools, then you can somehow spend a lot of time trying to cancel some terms in the generating set. It takes a lot of time, but Google Basics can do it quickly. So the thing you do it is, okay, this is an algebra geometry problem. So the thing is uh, you have this kind of idea, you try to do the intersection with uh, this smaller polynomial ring only in Z here, but this J in the section result is against the idea of it. So the theorem of a book a book tells you that this J is generated by the global basis of I intersecting with this one. You simply just tell you that you get the global basis. You look at the global basis, you find all the global basis elements with Z only, and then you really get a finite set and this finite set generating uh, this kind of J as an intersection result. So note that this ideal here is uh, not just an infinite set, but also linearly infinite dimensional. If you take this intersection, okay, mathematically it's defined, but computationally it's impossible. But this is a finite set. To take the intersection is a trivial question. It's something com uh, computationally possible. But here you have to be very careful. This, uh, computational global basis, you have to use the lexical graphic all the way. This y1 higher than y2, higher than ym, higher than z1. That means you really try to get rid of this part. Okay. This lexical graphic all the way, which is very on nature, but it's useful for the elimination. This one uh, is expensive. Something slightly better is you can use a block all the way, because this one is a block. That one is another block and do this kind of mixed block all the way. Then this makes the computation much easier. But right now I just use this kind of next graphic. Look at this kind of equation. I have x, y, and z, three equations. Okay, quite long, you know, okay. possibly you try to numerically solve it. It's not some easy task. But the one way to solve it is uh, you possibly want to remove x and y to get a one equation in z only. So here you don't need to really by hand to cancel x and y. It's not an easy task. Put a group of basis, x higher than y, higher than z, and do the monomial ordering next to graphic. And then you look at the group of basis. You can find that for this intersection, there's one monomial only in z, not in x, y. So this is a generating set of the j. That means uh, uh, this kind of j is generated by this equation only. So basically you have three variables, three equations, but Doing this kind of elimination, you reduce that to this kind of uh, one variable and uh, this kind of one equation problem can easily be solved. 
after this one is solved, you can really plug it into this kind of y and x. Then you really solve the, the whole thing. If you're really interested in solving numerically, then you can all you can reduce that to one variable, one equation problem, and solve it. But uh, I have to warn you that uh, this is a special case. It's possible that uh, after this kind of group based computation, you find that, okay, I don't find any equation in Z. That means, okay, somehow uh, this equation system is uh, uh, a little bit uh, strange. You can't reduce that to one variable. That's also possible. Not uh, uh, all this kind of equation system can be reduced to this kind of one variable problem. For example, if you really here only have x, y, but here you just naively say x, y, z, remove x, y. Uh, of course, you don't get anything because you don't have any kind of constraints on z. Okay, so you don't get anything. It's possible. I also have to say that although it's a one way, very classical way to solve polynomial equation, even if it works, it's a bad uh, practice to do this. Because if you really want numerical work to do this, although this kind of one variable thing can easily solve it with whatever tools, it's only one variable, one equation. But the thing is when you plug it back into this y and x, this one you will get a more and more error in this kind of a float number computation. So this one is just a, a, some classical way to solve the Ukrainian system, but it's not the best way. So next lecture, I will introduce some modern way of solving it without uh, really trying to eliminate all the other variables, keep one variable, solve one variable, put it back. So this classical way is uh, somehow out of date. Uh, of course, okay, if you like, you can say this one can be used for CHY scattering equation. You can get uh, one equation in one variable. Okay. So another thing more useful with the linear theory is the chain of variable. So in many cases, okay, if you know this ideal system or the polynomial system has some symmetry like this one, we just say it has S3 symmetry, although the S3 symmetry is hidden somewhere. Okay, if you don't use global basic, don't say that. But right now with global basic, you saw this S3 uh, the symmetry is already there. So in this case, instead of solving them in the original naive coordinate x1, x2, x3, you want to define some advanced coordinate s1, s2, s3. This s1 is, uh, okay, s1, s2, s3, there's an elementary uh, the symmetric polynomials in x1, x2, x3. So in this case, you want to replace this kind of things with uh, s1, s2, s3, you get a more reasonable equation system. So to do this, it's not a linear algebra problem because you can't solve it directly. So they are nonlinear equation. You cannot solve X in terms, you cannot solve X in terms of S and put it back. So in this case, you need a global basis. I consider this idea, this symmetrical idea as one equation system, but also I add some auxiliary equations, this definition of this kind of elementary symmetrical polynomials. Now I can say group basis. I try to get rid of this kind of x1, x2, x3, and I keep s3, s2, s1, the symmetric coordinates. I use this kind of block ordering here instead of this very slow lexographic ordering. So I can get a nice equation. Okay, so these equations, they are only in s, not in x. So you know for this kind of s, it itself is a symmetric polynomial. So explicitly I make this system S3 permutational invariant. So it looks much better than the original equation. And uh, then I believe that, okay, if this one has a symmetry, you want this kind of ex symmetry explicit for the rest of the computation, then you can just uh, everywhere replace this kind of X uh, symmetric function by this kind of S and do the computation. It's much, much easier than with this kind of hidden symmetry variables, X1, X2. So this one, um, you, you can use it for uh, one question. So for example, if you do integrability, you start with a beta ansatz equation. That's why it's completely symmetric. But although it's not explicitly symmetric, but then you can change it to this kind of elementary symmetric variables, S variables. And then you get a new kinds of beta ansatz equation. So this has some uh, history here. So this change is called, you go from beta ansatz equation to the Baxter QQ system. Okay. So you can say by, of course, if you really do this kind of box the trick system, you have to be an expert in this uh, integrability, but with the uh, computational algebra geometry, just by this nonlinear change of variables, you can do a lot of things. Almost equivalent to this kind of uh, integrability physics work. 
So I think today I didn't finish this lecture one because I think the lecture one is uh, very compressed, contains uh, a lot of mathematical concepts, a lot of uh, examples. And I think next lecture I will continue with this uh, lecture one uh, material. And another thing is I think that tonight sometime I'm going to put the project uh, on the website of the Slack, so I think uh, students could have a look and uh, try to do some kind of preparation work. I think I stop here and uh, thanks for your patience. So if you still have some questions, you can ask. Christoph, go ahead and meet yourself. Um, yeah, I would have a question. So if you compute the Grobner basis um, in a polynomial where the, the coefficients, so the, the field itself also has um, parameters, so it's also a ring. Yes. How does the, uh, the Grobner basis change depending on what variables you include as parameters and what variables you use as um, okay. in your... I think I stopped the short of the I stop the sharing of the notebook. I go to the mathematic program immediately so you can have the effect of the planet. Okay. So so can you see my I think I should maybe I need to put it a full screen. Can you see my uh, mathematical notebook? Yes. Yes, okay. So here I can give you one example. So the idea equals uh, whatever is uh, a x square plus b x plus c. I consider this is the quadratic polynomial in x. I consider the derivative to a x plus b as a derivative. Uh, of course, uh, you understand what I'm doing here. So if these two things in x, if they have a common uh, if they have a common solution, that just means, uh, okay, uh, this discriminator is zero. Okay, this is a high school math. So here we use a global basis to try to say uh, this fact, global basis is ideal with uh, x, uh, for actually for one variable, it doesn't matter what kind of order you have, but uh, for the good practice, I still put this degree reverse. Just copy from here, degree reverse next to graphic. So there are two ways to do it. One way is uh, you just to say, okay, I have A, B, C here, but I don't claim it. But another thing is I claim it. Coefficient. Uh, coefficient. So there are two ways to do this. One way, okay, if you run it, you find that you get a completely different result. So the first thing is you don't claim this ABC are parameters. You just do the computation. ABC are symbols, they are not parameters. Okay, then they don't know you are really working with uh, this rational function ABC uh, field. Okay, just think, think that ABC is some kind of uh, symbols especially this kind of symbols, you cannot divide by it because you didn't claim it's a field. Then by doing this kind of global basis computation and then the global basis is not so powerful, you get something like this, okay. For the second one, if you do the, this kind of computation, this kind of ABC, you claim that you are working with the rational function fields. In this case, you don't know that for the generic polynomial of ABC, I have the freedom to divide by that. So because it's a field, it's a rational function field. In this case, you get a much simpler result because the freedom to divide this one, okay, by itself. Then you get one here, but this one is a coefficient. Okay, there's not some kind of symbol, you have freedom to divide by that. So you get a one here. So what's the mathematical meaning of it? For the first one, okay, sorry. I do share it again. Yeah, for the first one, you can say, I get this complicated b squared minus 4ac, actually that's the discriminant of it. So that means so I have some obstruction to go further for this global com basis computation, I leave it here, stop. 
but that one means I, so everything has the freedom to divide and any kind of uh, parameter. So this one means that, uh, okay, I do this kind of group basis computation, actually the result is still quite, quite undetermined because this one is some unfinished result. This one was zero or not. But that one is, I consider this ABC in a coefficient field, a rational field. So in this case, I can just uh, uh, claim that ABC for generic ABC, okay, these two, uh, equation that has no common solution, or I can say for the generic quadratic equation in X, we don't have the double root generically. But that one, consider all the situations, that's uh, actually more complicated result. Uh, that one tells you that uh, you could uh, really see the obstruction. Sometimes you have a double root, sometimes you don't have double root. Okay, so it's just like that. You can either claim this kind of coefficients um, in your field or not. And then the results could be actually, you can also define what is group basis, not just the over field, over a ring. So this is a group basis over a ring. So this one is also used, but this one is a hard computation. Okay, thanks. I get it. All right, uh, if there are no uh, further questions, let's uh, unmute ourselves briefly and give Yang uh, a round of applause.